in a leafy suburb of Toronto, lives one of the world's most controversial thinkers. Come on in. Thank you. Jordan. Hey. Psychology professor Jordan Peterson caused a storm in late 2016 with a couple of YouTube videos about changes to the law in Canada around gender pronouns. You came in from where? I came in from London last night. His university campus became a battleground. That's assault right there. Officer, I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything that happened. Like if I asked you, would you please use they them pronouns for me? What? What? It would depend on what, what I hoops do you want us to jump through? Those what are my you... pronouns. Those are my There's pronouns. There's no motivation. No, I know. Like... No one ever has any motivation. His opponents accused him of being transphobic. Many others rallied to support him. His job was threatened, but he refused to back down. He claimed that the new law pushed forward an authoritarian political agenda. I was being asked, as everyone is, to use a certain set of words that I think are the constructions of people who have a political ideology that I don't believe in and that I also regard as, as dangerous. To me, they're, 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 they're an attempt to control language and, and in a direction that isn't happening organically, it's not happening naturally, but by force and by fiat, and I would say by force because there's legislative power behind them. So and I don't so like under... these made-up words, Z just... and Zer and that sort of okay, thing. What about... For Peterson, this wasn't really about pronouns. This was a surface reflection of a much deeper crisis. The legislation itself and the policies were signifying a crisis, a disjunction in Western society that was, was far, of which the gender pronoun argument was only a tiny tendril. I put my finger on a nerve. As time passed, many of those who flocked to his videos for an attack on political correctness became hooked by his message of transformation and transcendence, and began calling him one of the most profound thinkers of the time. As a journalist and filmmaker for TV networks like Channel 4 and the BBC, I'm trained to be sceptical of these kind of grand claims. But over the last few months of listening to his lectures, I've become convinced that what he is saying is that significant. Which is why I've come all the way to Toronto to interview him. Peterson has been studying belief systems his whole life, and how the most utopian ideas can create the worst outcomes and he's concluded that only appreciation and integration of the great ideas of the past would protect us from the same things happening again. I've always been surprised that I've been able to teach what I've been teaching in the universities, because I've always regarded it as crazily radical in a sense, you know. It's crazily radical in a conservative way. Well, I don't know what to make of that. Your no. teaching is crazily radical? In a conservative way, yeah. I mean, it's in a conservative way because I think that the past is not only has value, it's we cannot live without the integration of the past. No more than you can live as an individual without integrating your past. I mean, we're historical creatures, right? And, and we, we, without, if we're not united con consciously with the past, then we're divided w internally and socially, and that has consequences. So some of them are playing themselves out in the political divisions in the current world but the consequences can be fatal. His fascination with the nature of belief systems started when he was a young man, haunted by the threat of nuclear annihilation during the Cold War. I was trying to solve this terrible puzzle that confronted me for, and many other people about how it was that human beings got themselves in such a tangle about what they believed. Such a tangle that we were pointing the ultimate weapons of destruction at one another, which, by the way, we are still doing. And I thought, okay, well, I understand that. We need our belief systems. They orient us. And that means there will be conflict between belief systems, and that can be a catastrophe. And that's being played out everywhere, again, in very many ways. What's the solution to that? Well, one possibility is there's no solution. It's just mayhem all the way around. Could be the case. 
But it seemed to me, as I delved into it, that the proper solution to that was to live properly. He believes the answers for how to live properly are all around us if we look carefully. The artists get there before the philosophers, long before the philosophers. The dramatists get there way before the artists even. And so we, we figured it out. We represented it in art and literature and music and drama. And then we're on the cusp, so to speak, of understanding it in a fully articulated manner and not a moment too soon. So what is that idea? Basically that there's a hidden story of transformation and transcendence and it's encoded in our mythology, in our religion, in our biology and in our actions. Peterson is reviving the thought of Carl Jung, the renegade psychologist who delved deeply into the human subconscious to develop the theory of archetypes universal patterns of being, such as the Divine Mother or the Hero, shared by all in the collective unconscious. The way it looks to me is that we embody a lot of information in our action, right? and our action has developed as a consequence of imitating other people, and not only the people, the people around us, but of course the people around us imitated the people who came before them, and those people imitated the people who came before them, and so on so far back that it's as far back as you can go. And so you embody these patterns of behavior that are extremely informative, that you don't understand, that are a consequence of collective imitation across the centuries. And so then those patterns can become manifest as figures of the imagination. And those figures of imagination are the distillations of patterns of behavior. And so as the distillations of patterns of behavior, they have content. And it's not you, that content. It's, you could even think about it as content that's evolved, although it's culturally transmitted. It's content that's evolved. And so these figures of the imagination can reveal the structure of reality to you. And that's what happened with Jung. And that's what he described in the Red Book. And that was what permeated his psychology, a psychology that was based on the presupposition that the fundamental archetypal structures of religious belief were not pathological, not deceitful, not protective in some delusional sense against the fear of death, but quite the contrary. The very stories that enabled us to move forward as confident human beings in the face of chaos itself. And it's conceivable, I think perhaps probable, that nothing more important conceptually happened in the 20th century than that. Because it was the first time post-enlightenment that a rapprochement between the intellect and the underlying religious archetypal substructure occurred. You have in the capacious intellect of Jung, and the same thing happened to some degree with Piaget, the religious domain and the factual domain were brought back together. And the fact of Jung's enduring and increasing popularity and influence, I would say, is a direct consequence of that. Peterson is reviving Jung and grounding his discoveries in the latest neuroscience, explaining how these mythological archetypes are encoded in our brains and bodies, tying together mythology, psychology, morality and religion with science. You're adrift without it. You have to you have to have a conscious relationship with the archetypes. Yeah. There's no way, if you don't, then you're susceptible to possession. That's yeah. basically, or to, or to despair. Yeah. So, and no wonder. Well, you've got to have axioms. So the right yes. axioms are the archetypes. Yes, that's why they exist. Mm. So do you see archetypes as biological structures? They're at least that. Yeah, they're pre-existing pre categories of perception. In the, in the Kantian sense, that, that's a good way of thinking about it, is that, you know, the, the pure empiricist thinks that you get all your information from the outside world, right? Mm. But that's not true because you bring an a priori interpretive framework to the world. Yeah. And that's instantiated biologically, but then it's also enculturated. So separating the archetype from the underlying biological reality isn't easy. So you have the snake, you have the propensity to, to perceive reptilian predators. The manner in which 
those things are represented in the culture fill those holes essentially and, and so, so that, that can in the same way as the language instinct forms. fills yeah, in. Yeah, that's right, the, exactly. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's the same thing. Like the archetypes are, are manifestations of the universal grammar, grammar of emotion and motivation. That's a good way of thinking about it. Now, they may be more than that. For the full 90-minute interview with Jordan Peterson and more documentaries and interviews about the biggest ideas, check out the Rebel Wisdom website. We're also running workshops for men to give a direct experience of transformation integration and purpose. Thank you for watching.